So today my talk is about building and measuring a valuable ecosystems. My name is Mark Gooden. I am the CTO of WeTrade. Um, WeTrade is a joint venture um, owned by 11 banks, 11 European banks. Um, we, I develop the, uh, and execute the technology strategy. Um, I designed the, uh, operating model of the company and we trade is an innovative, uh, trade platform based on blockchain in 15 countries in Europe. We trade is the first blockchain digital based trade finance platform in production. Today, I'm going to talk about an ecosystem and what's the definition and why an ecosystem and why we talk about ecosystems. Um, I'll talk about blockchain as an ecosystem enabler and knowing your participants and effectively how we actually measure in some, some KPIs in terms of measuring ecosystem um, performance. So why an ecosystem? What has changed? Um, the first point used to be data is uh, is oil. Um, I think in the in this green world, uh, we can actually really, and in this changing world, we really see that data is a valuable, uh, renewable uh, resource. Um, it can be pooled, it can be shared, reused, but we also want to make sure that uh, we make the you know we we make the most out of the data, while securing that we can trust and we can protect that data from misuse. Companies no longer are willing to pass that value and the value of the data over to intermediaries. And new, mis new business models are being driven based on data insights and, and, and you know, even other new technologies such as AI. Why does it matter? We all need trusted um, data, verified data, um, you know, non-repudiated data, immutable data. Um, blockchain is, um, you know, a, a, it's an environment on, and you know in where collaborators can come together and they can actually put you know good stronger governance around the data uh, and particularly in terms of you know what data needs to be shared with who and what time during the process um, with blockchain we have a great um, you know potential for creating marketplaces and new marketplaces based on new business models and then again, you know, people can actually use the data, um, you know, for, you know, driving insights and innovate new ideas, new products, new services. Why start or why join an ecosystem? Well, common problems exist, common problems, you know, for, you know, in trade, common problems, problems in logistics in climate action and in accounting. So effectively, you know, organizations are actually, as they start to collaborate and start to understand, you know, you know, the existing business models where they are and they identify problems, well then effectively they, you know, they, they can come together to solve these problems in a, you know, in a better and more efficient way. They can share risks. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of inherent risks in terms of trying to go your own and then trying to, you know, um, you know, trying to deliver value, incremental value, you know, to customers. And, you know, so there's a lot of risk involved, you know, so why companies come together or why they start an ecosystem is so that they can actually share that risk. They obviously um, finances and even in today's world where from a financial perspective, you know, given uh, the pandemic and the, and the outcome of the pandemic, pooled finances. So being able to, to be honest, working, you know, you know, with this new technology, um, even though it's fantastic that Hyperledger um, and Fabric and, and, and Sawtooth and various other DLTs and tools and components are open source, but it doesn't mean that it all runs for free. And especially when you're trying to actually pool together, you know, and create a network or a platform in which, you know, a lot of uh, participants actually come together. They can actually, uh, you know, to be able to run and operate a service with the security, with uh, the, um, you know, all of the underlying infrastructure that's required, um, with actually all of the just the development tasks that are required, it becomes very, very expensive very, very quickly. So again, you know, by creating an ecosystem, you can actually share the cost of that across the, the initial ecosystem members. 
And, you know, it, it really is a case, you know, in terms of when, when going with an ecosystem, you don't need to go it alone. You can actually, you know, uh, you can, you know, you don't, and, and one organization doesn't need to take on the expenses all by themselves. When we create value and we're talking about digitizing and optimizing um, efficient, uh, you know, the existing uh, processes, but we're also looking at deriving value from new business models, new products and new services, whether they're part of the core offering of the ecosystem or whether they become value added services. And you kind of look and you can listen across the ecosystem participants and the, and the users to actually see uh, you know, and to solicit feedback in terms of where do they, what, you know, where do they see new value being derived, um, you know, or potential value being uh, derived from the ecosystem. We talk about building and, and, and strengthening relationships. And this is a case of, you know, with customers being able to, you know, offer your customers new services, new products, but it's also being able to, you um, you know, drive, uh, you know, to build and strengthen relationships with ecosystem members, like like minded members where they have the same or very similar appetite for risks, where they're willing to put in the same level of, uh, you know, of uh, investment and pooling that, uh, you know, the, the, the finances and where they all have this shared vision of about the value that they're actually looking to drive uh, and, and deliver to their prospective customers. Um, you know, you know, with the ecosystems, we look at about increasing efficiencies and minimizing governance costs. Again, just you know, being able to, well, you can pool the finances to generate the initial, you know, the, you know, the product, the services, the ecosystem. But it's also a case of being able to run and govern, and that ecosystem. Again, without having to go it alone, you, you're actually able to pool those resources to be able to, you know, to to have. Uh, somebody manage and, and, and govern you know that ecosystem and we're really creating a distributed shared source of truth without the need for intermediaries um, we've all seen you know over the last number of years with blockchain the whole um, idea of disintermediating um, data disintermediating the service and you know when you know joining this ecosystem it can be very very difficult when you're um, you know trying to build something internally with having an external externally for um uh, out you know with an external outlook in terms of you know because people want to be you know ecosystem builders want to be there at the very very start so they can help shape and then they can actually really understand it at a very early stage what can you do um there you can join um in already existing ecosystem so and that's really looking at you know optimizing for yourself you join um you know a, a network or an ecosystem probably lo a lo lower the cost of entry lower barrier in terms of you know whether it's you know having to you know design think build operate release deploy govern making sure depending on which domain you're in making sure that you've got all of the regulatory requirements uh taken care of so it's really kind of, you know, you could, you know, the, one of the options is that you can join an already existing ecosystem. And again, depending on, you know, what, you know, uh, you know, what domain that ecosystem is, again, you, you, you could get help and assistance in terms of whether it's business case development, value, and really even understanding and learning. Uh, one can build um, a new ecosystem uh, or a new consortium from scratch. Um, you know, and, and, and there will continue to be new ecosystems built throughout the couple of years. Um, but again, again, we, we, we talk about network of networks. We talk about one network not ruling the world. We talk about one ecosystem. You know, you know, there won't be one one place. So there will always be places for collaboration and interconnectivity and interoperability between different ecosystems and not just ecosystems of the same and a discipline such as trade or logistics or, or, or uh, you know, social, uh, you know, carbon, um, you know, climate action and accounting. Um, but again, we will actually be connecting some of these different ecosystems together to derive even more value, more business models, um, you know, more benefits to, to the end users. Or one can expand, um, you know, so you can join an existing ecosystem uh, and also then offer new value added services to those ecosystem members. And one can then connect to that ecosystem member. So really, I mean, when we talk about expanding, we're talking about really, you know, either, you know, joining 
where you have, for example, you know, uh, you know, a finance um, trade um, network, and then you kind of take in a logistics network because you actually want to be able to, you, you take in or you connect within the uh, logistics network because you want to be able to take in the information of and the traceability and tracking of the goods. In some, there's two ways you can do that. You can have the logistics providers come in as value-added services directly onto the, the trade, uh, into the trade ecosystem, or you can connect a trade ecosystem and a, a logistics ecosystem to arrive then that even expanded um, value. Blockchain as an ecosystem uh, enabler, multi-party manage, uh, multi-party workflow management is really all about ma uh, managing the workflow and the data between the multiple parties of the ecosystem. For example, you know the process between a trade, uh, you know of a trade between a buyer and a seller, where the where the buyer has sought a bank guarantee and the seller has also sought an uh, invoice financing. We talk about the disintermediation. Um, we're talking about really blockchain inherently because you know comes with immutability and the non-repudiation. Uh, but often as a core driver within a blockchain ecosystem is the dis disintermediation of data, control and management of the data and the removal of the intermediaries. When we talk about governing and the network democratically, it's really all about change. For example, onboarding new ecosystem participants, deploying smart code contracts, agreed by consensus between the multiple parties within within the uh, within the network. Um, from you know starting small scale and you know with elasticity, um, you know as members and transaction volumes increase, it's really starting with the whole idea of you know starting with a minimal viable. Um, product minimal with a minimal viable ecosystem and then looking to create and achieve value from that ecosystem sustainably while laying the foundations for the ecosystem to scale and um, scale and growth will evolve on a continuous uh, basis based on customer and client feedback and the goal is really to achieve a, a, you know an organic self-sustaining ecosystem when we could talk about immutability and traceability discussions can come you know discussions really come about you know the um dispute resolution and here we can leverage the immutability and the traceability of the data to aid in dispute resolution on a blockchain um based uh, ecosystem and a single source of truth really data is shared and it can be segmented through ledgers channels private data collections but it's really about like you know that privacy you know, and you know, providing access to that data on a need to access uh, and a need to know uh, basis. Blockchain business progression. Um, so, you, companies or organizations maybe start to, um, you know, start kind of a little bit ego uh, system centric. In other words, they're kind of building it for themselves. Maybe as a POC, they come up with a, a minimal viable product. Um, you know, and effectively, to be honest, this is how we trade started. It started with a POC uh, for would one individual bank. They had a, a minimal viable product. They had a very good concept. It was very much at the core. You know, it was it was actually built in um, a public um, a permissionless blockchain. It was built on um, Ethereum originally, before we switched over to Hyperledger Fabric. But again, we just saw um, you know that the value of the POC in terms of what it could do in, in, in terms of evolving and revolutionizing, you know, in, in you know, trade uh, and with the use of blockchain. And then we actually, a, a number of members actually came together and they saw okay, the potential in terms of building an ecosystem. So this is where we talked about a minimal viable ecosystem. And again, the arrows really indicate like, you know, where you had initial core idea and the arrows are different tangents could be new opportunities, new ideas in terms of how we could actually evolve and offer new products and services on that minimal viable ecosystem to members of that uh, of that network. And then kind of we're looking at really, uh, you know, the whole industry utility where, you know, blockchain, and it, at least in some aspects and for some ecosystems will be kind of considered very much a, a utility, you know, whether it's in food, whether it's in agri, whether it's in maritime whether it's in in trade some of these you know um you know are kind of providing utilities and it's been able to connect these but it's all about really kind of designing for uh for for, for a market 
Um, we'll also talk about then, you know, putting in incentive models, you know, how do you incentivize new ecosystem participants to join? How do you incentivize the existing ecosystems in terms of to increase uh, in terms of uh, transaction volumes? So really looking at how we can actually uh, look at creating these new incentive uh, models. And again, by actually looking to incentivize, then we're looking to create even new digital products, new services, new value-added services, some that we thought, okay, would automatically fit in terms of the domains that, you know, where some of these original ecosystems, you know, start out from. And others are really kind of looking at new digital products or services that could be offered, um, you know, through the ecosystem. And then we really kind of get to the ecosystem centric, you know, as we kind of move over to the right and we talk about token economy, uh, business networks and connecting all of these business networks. Know your participant members. Um, you know, this is actually, uh, it was taken, um, you know, this, I, I, this is taken a reference taken from Leading Digital, which is really about, uh, it was a book and written in 2014. So uh, before blockchain, but and it was really talking about like, you know, business transformation and turning technology into business transformation. But the matrix actually fits even today, um, you know, from, uh, from a blockchain perspective, I mean, it's still very, very relevant. Because when we talk about beginners, you know, the, you know, they may be skeptical of the business value uh, of, you know, blockchain, for example. They may carry out some experiments, but not really fully committed at this stage. And they and they have a, you know, and they may have an immature digital culture. And, you know, they're not ready or, or they're waiting and seeing and they adopt the wait and see strategies or approaches. As we move then into conservatives, you know, they may have an overarching uh, digital vision, but it's underdeveloped. Um, a few um, advanced uh, digital features exist, although traditional capabilities, you know, may be more mature. They have strong governance across the silos and active steps to build, um, you know, and they activate steps to build digital skills and culture. Fashionistas. Um, fashionistas, you know, they advance many digital features such as social media, blockchain, big data, AI, IoT, and they're working on all of them in silos. They have no overarching or they may have no overarching vision on how to connect them all, underdeveloped coordination because they're you know, stuck in silos. Um, a digital culture exists, but again, it could be siloed based. And again, these, you know, some of these guys might try multiple um, ecosystems, even of the same domain or same type. So because they want to be in everything so that if one succeeds, they'll always say, well, we were part of the winner type of thing. And then you've got digital masters, strong overarching digital vision. They're able to get, you know, they've excellent governance across the silos, bringing about the organizational changes necessary when adopting new technologies. Um, and many digital initiatives generating business value and they have strong digital vision. And it's really a case of when, you know, from experience, you know, in, in terms of building an ecosystem, you really want to have a look at your digital masters because they really help you in terms of steering where, you know, the most benefit in terms of where your ecosystem or where your platform should be evolving. Eco, there are a lot of characteristics and I like, you know, I've, I've, I've picked this particular one, ecosystem member velocity. Some members will will move at the speed of a scooter and others will move at the speed of a locomotive. Um, and again, this is across a number of different areas, whether it's knowledge and expertise, whether it's training, whether it's a risk appetite, whether it's the adoption of new technology. And, you know, three years ago and even two years ago, blockchain was 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 relative was very new, of course, especially um, enterprise and, and permission blockchain. And we're really talking about here in terms of also in terms of cooperation and collaboration as opposed to competition and protectionism. So, you know, really having a look at, you know, ecosystem members who are open to new business and, 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 and revenue models. Critical success factors. We talk about um, incentive design. So each marketplace participant, you know, having a, a fair and rein, reinforcing incentives to want to increase uh, you know, a trading activity on the marketplace with an easy onboard and an immediate effect. Network effect, we really talk about the network effect becoming the dominant service provider for target markets for both traditional services and new innovative services 
with with rapid adoption from a governance design perspective you know each um participant must have a fair role in defining and redefining marketplace rules including the incentive models data access really for about privacy control and its monetization in a competitive market a degree of uh, decentralization is is required for ecosystem kpis we talk about growth, so really growth of the ecosystem, whether it's the number of uh, specific you know, um, uh, stakeholders or members, is really the density of the ecosystem members, members of the same segment, industry, or um, you know even just you know valid, value added services members. Growth and online engagement. We really talk about a common understanding of what is a transaction, and what we may start out as a core transactions. Then you actually talk about you know even you know, the, these value added services transactions and being able to count, you know, the various way, you know, the, and, the, and, the, and the increase in the growth in terms of the transactions on the platform or as part of from ecosystem members. We talk about then the number of meaningful uh, connections within the network. We're really talking about providing a platform or an ecosystem where members come together to create new connections while at the same time strengthening or reinforcing existing connections. A lot of business today, um, you know, as we know, it's been really done, you know, paper based and we're kind of using uh, in a, in a, a paper based or in, in a, you know, centralized way. And really what we're kind of doing with blockchain is decentralizing, digitizing, optimizing. Um, but again, we just need to make sure then, you know, that that is, you know, that we reinforce, you know, those connections, you know, to the, to the users. And, and we kind of because change is hard so we need to make sure that we kind of bring them along in terms of as we're looking to digitize you know already existing paper-based processes or even go into new marketplaces and new areas um you know for for new um revenue generation ecosystem density the number of nodes or relationships within um the um ecosystem this is similar to linkedin how many people like you know what are the engagements and how are the engagements uh, between the ecosystem members um you know whether it's you know end users in, in we trades case of its buyers and sellers how are they engaging with each other on the platform yeah um successful conversion of business opportunities between members so again this is all about you know successful transactions in a multi-party system between the parties for example in a trade network the number of trades between counterparties are they trading just doing a one-off trade are they doing repeat trades? Are they actually moving more and more of their business onto the um, onto the platform because they actually see the success? So it's really looking at monitoring that because then you know you've got a really good viable ecosystem that one can uh, build on as you know as part of a foundation. And we're talking about income. Um, so income stats. I mean, okay, everybody is looking. You know, investors, partners, sponsors, even members. They're all looking at what's the return on investment. You know what's in it for them how can we derive value from the ecosystem making sure that the you know whether it's operating costs in line with revenues making sure that you know in terms of as you deliver value-added services what is the cost of actually delivering that service versus the income of actually um delivering you know uh, the, the, you know the, the the income that you can derive from um from, you know, from offering that uh, value-added service from stakeholders perspective you know as they deliver capital you know as they uh, as they give capital investments you know what is their expectation in terms of return on on, on you know return on that um in, you know investment capital so it's really kind of looking at making sure that you deliver and you provide a, a viable reliable sust self-sustaining ecosystem for all of all of the members because you know as we look to some of these ecosystems, nobody wants to be joining an ecosystem for a year and then they move their business over and they have the cost of moving their business over to that new ecosystem only for that ecosystem not to be uh, to be there 12 months later, 18 months later. So it's really making sure that's where you need to make sure you've got a, a good viable ecosystem that is self-sustaining and then can grow organically over, over time while delivering value at all aspects. I've got a cute, I'm gonna, um, so presentation i'm going to kind of open it up for a, a q a so um by all means i will have a look at the q a if people want to um, ask questions okay so uh benedict uh can you talk a bit about democratic management tools used at we trade um 
So yes, yeah, so, so so we trade. Um, so uh, as people may know, we are a consortium of banks, um, and primarily we started in the uh, trade and trade finance um, area, and we use um, you know so so we trade is a separate entity. Uh, our shareholders are our banks, but we're a separate entity. The governance in terms of how we evolve the product is with we trade. Um, we listen to our banks and effectively their customers to um, derive, you know, what features, functions, what capabilities they want to what they want to see, and effective, you know, from from that point, then we really kind of set, we set out the roadmap. Um, obviously, making sure it's in line with the overall strategy of uh, of the company, uh, with you know, in line with the board of directors and our shareholders. So, from a we trade perspective, we govern you know the evolution of that platform we have we 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 had uh we, we i mean we do have various uh work streams um or councils as we talk uh, as as we talked about so where we have members of you know uh, you know whether it's a technology we, we used to have a, you know technology councils security councils legal councils we used to have um you know uh, product councils and these councils would then meet with the various uh, stakeholders you know from the each of those disciplines and then again we trade was the glue between all of these councils where we would then kind of listen to all of the feedback from all of the council members and then we would act from there with then we would drive the overall approach and strategy of uh, you know what we need to do from a product service build legal compliance regulatory all of these different aspects Benedict, I hope that answers your questions. If it doesn't, feel free to um, post another one. How do different intermediaries, um, I'm just going to go to the next one in line, it was anonymous. How do different intermediary laws applicable around the world could be enabled? Is there any option to incorporate financial legal aspects across partnering nations? There are quite, um, when we trade started out, um, we designed, um, and, and, and this was one of the, the councils that we talked about, we actually incorporated and came up with our own uh, rule book and that we went to then with whether it was uh, the EU uh, or the bank, uh, you know, EBA and um, the European Banking Association and, you know, and the EU regulators, financial regulators. We also then, through our member banks, went through each of the um, local regulators of each of our banks because we were looking at offering new services that there were no standards and, and no rules or, or, or laws that could actually really govern it. Um, so we worked with the local regulators in the various um, you know, jurisdictions. Um, we have a pretty solid um, a, you know, a rule book um, and uh, you know, so, so, so that, that can be used in, in or, other jurisdictions outside uh, of, of Europe. Um, but obviously, I mean, we see that, you know, the, there's quite a, you know, whether it's ICA, you know, the ICC and the DSI with their various standards, we see uh, Unicetlar with, with, with their laws and their model laws. So there's more and more laws that are actually coming, uh, you know, but that are being generated. Quite a lot of them are, you know, a flavor of what's already been there before and just, you know, just applying digital, um, you know, a digital connotation to some of the existing laws. Um, we trade so far, you know, with every new region that we've had to go to, every new country or whatever, we've been working with the local regulators with, with our rule book. And so far, you know, what we've actually designed uh, from our rule book perspective had, has no changes. So it, whether we were going to, uh, and, and, you know, I have sensitive information that I can't say, but we were going to other regions outside Europe. And from the feedback that we've had so far with all of these local regulators, no changes required in terms of um, in terms of uh, changes on the rule book. Um, anonymous, hope that answers your question. Um, ten or ten, uh, do enterprise ask for concrete business value of blockchain solutions? Um, I think everybody is asking for concrete uh, business value and business cases of uh, of any solution, not just blockchain solutions. Um, do you use specific tools to quantify uh, blockchain um, uh, business value or is it qualitative statements? No. Um, so we use, uh, effectively, as I've said, we have an operating model, we have a revenue, uh, we have a charging model uh, based on transactions. Effectively, what we need to do is uh, we need to make sure that we trade as an organization is sustainable, um, you know, from and, and a resilient from a financial perspective. 
but also in terms of our ecosystem members. We've been working with, uh, with all of our ecosystem members to ensure that the, you know, to help them through the business case that they could derive by joining WeTrade to make sure that for ecosystem members that they're also able to run um, and, and to, to join WeTrade and to actually derive the value from it. So very much, um, analytical very much uh, qualitative um you know and very much you know we 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 have all of the data there in terms of transactions you know proceed you know forecasts actuals you know the charges for all of these so we have you know you know we've been live since you know uh, january 2019 we have quite we've amassed quite a, a you know amount of data over that um o over the last two and a half years to really help new members and new ecosystems um, you know, to guide them on the path of actually, you know, deriving the most value that they can out of um, out of uh, out of WeTrade and out of joining WeTrade. Uh, Eugene, what kind of challenges does uh, WeTrade um, and other um, finance or trade finance industries face? Very short answer in this because I know we're tight on time and we're over time. Regulatory, financial regulatory um, guidelines or um, legal, um, you know, so really much. What are the matrix? Peter, what are the metrics for blockchain operations to be measured uh, value to the customer? Metrics really is all about um, the density, well, density of participating ecosystem members, because if you've got uh, more, more ecosystem members, more business, uh, number of transactions, so volume of transactions, number of actual participants, users, you know, whether they be companies or whatever on the platform, because then it can actually derive new, you know, new, new business relationships as opposed to just exist, you know, on uh, trying to uh, digitize existing business um, uh, relationships. So really it's all, and then, you know, it's all about then how much of a business a customer can actually put through, through, through an ecosystem member and how efficient uh, we've seen that from a, from a WeTrade perspective, we've gone from um, processing of several days of a loan request down to an hour. You know, so again, that all, all, all that also brings efficiencies down to uh, you know to the end uh, end customer, and it also helps them manage liquidity. Okay. Um, Tan, I can if you want to reach out to me. If anybody wants to reach out to me privately, I think we are over time. Um, so, um, but if anybody wants to reach out privately, then, uh, you know, please do. And I'd be uh, more than welcome to, um, to answer, uh, questions.